I'd like to uh, welcome you to the Learner Lecture in Religion and Society. Um, and this is an endowed lecture uh, named after a family member, uh, named after a fa uh, family of one of our uh, past majors in the Religious Studies program at NYU. Um, this event is a Religious uh, Studies program event, but it's also co-sponsored by the uh, Department of Cinema Studies at, at Tisch, uh, the Center for Religion and Media, uh, and also sponsored by the CAS Dean, and so I thank the co-sponsors uh, for their support in this. Uh, the goal of the uh, Learner Lectures in Religion and Society is to address religion uh, as we address it in the Religious Studies program uh, at NYU, so not simply as a set of uh, beliefs and propositions about the world, but, uh, but rather as practices and ideas that are fundamentally social, as something that's, uh, that's public. And last spring, our inaugural lecture uh, by Diane Winston, for example, was uh, on the AIDS uh, epidemic and its representation in the media in the 1980s and the religious inflections of that representation. Uh, tonight's uh, lecture, Shadow of a Doubt, Hitchcock on Augustine Freud and Horrendous Evil, is by Jeffrey Stout. And Professor Stout is a professor of religion at Princeton University, of his various uh, offices and honors. He was the president of the American Academy of Religion in, in 2007. Uh, I also know Professor Stout as a teacher. Uh, I had the pleasure of attending his introductory uh, seminar as a young graduate student, uh, a semester survey in, in which I learned how much I had to learn about contemporary philosophy and, and critical thought as it pertains to the study of religion, and I'm still learning. Uh, like any good teacher, Jeff helped me understand what I don't know and just how much I don't know. Um, I myself am a historian, and so most of my work as a scholar is I, I find my strange sources and I read them and I fall in love with them, but and then in their particularity, I, I examine uh, religion and human social life. Uh, and so these are the issues that usually interest me. Um, and I, I don't usually find myself interested in philosophy, to be honest, and unless it has some bearing on these issues. And this is, at least for me, this is what's so compelling in Jeff's work. Uh, he is a serious philosopher. He takes thinking, arguments, and ideas seriously. Yet in his pragmatic approach, he shows us what is important beyond rarefied notions of the truth. His book, Democracy and Tradition, was published in 2003, for example, responds to those critics of American political culture, often religious and some conservative, who argue that we no longer have anything in common in our secular and plural society. Against these traditionalists, Professor Stout posits an American democratic tradition manifested in thinkers like Emerson, Whitman, and Dewey, as well as in our practices of demanding reasons from one another and our conversation about the public good. His work is both philosophical and contemporary in its interest, yet it also consists of unapologetic ethical exhortation. He addresses us in his work not just as thinkers, but as students, as, as teachers, and as citizens. Professor Stout is also a scholar willing to get his hands dirty in fields not his own. Well, until that he got his hands dirty, then they become his own. Uh, in response to the criticism of uh, democracy of tradition, that it was too armchair in its approach to democracy, he wrote Blessed are the Organized, Grassroots Democracy in America, which appeared in 2010. This book offers an ethnographic survey of several grassroots organizations, fleshing out his argument in democracy and tradition about the embodied practices and tradition of democratic organization, while simultaneously demonstrating the importance of religion for social mobilization. Something I like in particular uh, in this book was uh, Professor Stout's ability to demonstrate religion's subjective importance in people's lives and in their politics, but without reifying religion, without treating it as just something that causes people to do things, but still showing how important it is in their lives. Professor Stout's willingness to work outside of traditional, and he, since he writes on tradition, it's kind of a pun, but no pun intended, uh, outside of traditional academic spheres is also apparent in his work on film, uh, which we'll receive a, a taste of tonight. His lecture is part of a larger book project, and uh, it'd be interesting to also hear him talk about how this fits within that larger book project. And then also I'd be interested in actually hearing him talk about what the kind of intellectual links between the film project and the works that I just discussed. 
Um, the lecture is going to, this is not a traditional lecture because we're going to be here a, a longer time than usual because there's going to be film clips. Uh, and also afterwards, uh, Professor Richard Allen has offered to be a respondent. Uh, Professor Allen is the chair of cinema studies here. Uh, and he works on film theory and aesthetics, but it was a very happy coincidence uh, that uh, he offered to uh, uh, he's offered to respond because he's a foremost expert. It turns out on Hitchcock, and, and it turns out Jeff's a fan of his work, and so they can uh, agree with one another, or even more interestingly, disagree with one another, and uh, in our discussion afterwards. Um, so there's a reception afterwards in the lounge, and uh, please turn your cell phones off and uh, join me in welcoming Professor Stout as he tells us about Shadow of a Doubt, Hitchcock on Augustine Freud, and Horrendous Evil. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Adam. This lecture might be an example of fools rushing in where angels fear to tread. It's certainly a case in which I find it difficult to distinguish between bold and merely rash interpretive hypotheses. My topic is Alfred Hitchcock's Shadow of a Doubt, which he shot in 1942, released in 1943, and as late as 1964 re referred to as his best film. Richard Allen has declared it one of Hitchcock's most profound works, and I agree. I also agree with Professor Allen's interpretation of the film as far as it goes, and admire his use of the category of romantic irony to explain what Hitchcock is generally up to as a filmmaker. It is wonderful to have him here to lead our discussion after the lecture, and once I found out that he was doing so, I decided to steer my remarks a bit in his direction to uh, engage him more directly. According to Allen, Shadow of a Doubt is a recognition narrative. The heroine, played by Teresa Wright, is infatuated by the figure of her older uncle, a Jekyll Hyde dandy played by Joseph Cotton. They are both called Charlie and linked to one another by telepathy, a symbolic betrothal, a use of Freudian imagery to imply multiple incestuous relationships centered on Uncle Charlie, and a vampire motif. Uncle Charlie, Alan writes, is, quote, the vehicle of young Charlie's yearnings to transcend the dull world of small town Santa Rosa. Yet he turns out to represent everything that is opposed to young Charlie's aspirations for freedom and self-determination." Young Charlie moves in the course of the film from what uh, Alan calls blind faith in her uncle to a dawning sense of his guilt which moves her to act with the very independence she craves and looked to him to deliver. Alan rightly emphasizes that the new sense of self uh, young Charlie achieves by facing the truth about her uncle and eventually killing him brings with it a, quote, radical disenchantment with the world. She now faces the prospect of the very sort of boring conventional marriage that had horrified her at the outset of the film. Alan's word for young Charlie's ethical condition at the end of the story is conformity. All of this seems right to me. My question is what significance this conformity has for Hitchcock. Is he simply reflecting from the vantage of romantic aestheticism on one of the many psychological ways in which perversity and social conformity are intertwined? Or is he saying something more, something political perhaps, or even something theological? Is he participating in a broader American and British conversation about some of the social issues to which Adam was referring a few moments ago? The only way to test these possibilities is to venture out on some interpretive limbs and see whether they break. 
So suppose we begin with the term shadow in the film's title. Robin Wood introduced the notion that Hitchcock depicts a shadow world, and Richard Allen has insightfully linked this theme with the tropes and iconography of late Romanticism. But shadow is also a term that appears prominently in Carl Jung's Psychology and Religion, his Terry Lectures from 1937. In Plato's Republic and St. Augustine's Confessions. Jung used the term to designate the psyche's dark archetype. It is repression of the shadow, according to Jung, that releases horrendous evil into the world. That the film depicts horrendous evil is obvious, given that Uncle Charlie is a serial murderer. Of course, Uncle Charlie does not repress awareness of his darker side. He identifies with it. Young Charlie, however, spends two thirds of the film repressing her sense that her uncle is evil. And most of Santa Rosa remains blithely unaware of his true character at film's end. If Hitchcock is alluding to Jung, he might be saying something about the effects of repressing awareness of evil. And here we need to keep in mind that Hitchcock has arrived in the US from Britain only recently, and that Britain is under attack. Shadow of a Doubt is set in the months immediately before Pearl Harbor. The film takes meticulous care to allow us to identify the exact timing. So that's before America has joined the war. I'll come back to this. Shadow is Plato's term for the morally flawed art that must be banned from the Republic. Shadows projected on a wall are the illusions that the pri prisoners watch in the allegory of the cave. If Hitchcock is alluding to Plato, it might be that he is implying something about cinema as one of his critical targets. In Augustine's Confessions, the term shadow signifies failures of conversion. If Hitchcock is alluding to Augustine, could he be preparing to tell an Augustinian story about a failed conversion? So far, I am simply raising questions. Possible allusions in the title of a film are a flimsy basis uh, for an interpretation of it, but they can be suggestive, and in this case, I think they lead somewhere. Before turning to the details of the film that are relevant to the question I have, questions I have raised, let me say a few words about what Augustinianism might mean in this context. The French critics who first championed Hitchcock's greatness as an artist made much of his Roman Catholic upbringing and his Jesuit schooling. They did very little to clarify uh, what his Catholic commitments, if he had any uh, as an adult, might have amounted to. As Zizek has noted, subsequent film scholarship has mostly played down Hitchcock's Catholicism. Richard, Allen book, Richard Allen's book exemplifies this trend insofar as it attributes to Hitchcock's films what the back cover calls the amoral outlook of the romantic ironist or aesthete. P. Adam Sidney's 2003 essay on Vertigo uh, in the MoMA volume called The Hidden God is an exception. He argues that many of Hitchcock's American films introduce Roman Catholic or biblical elements, often in a way that appears to suggest, as he puts it, that the protagonists err through blindness to the sacraments, or by turning a deaf ear to citations of scripture around them. Some of his films even imply, Sidney writes, that film going and filmmaking themselves arise from a propensity to sin to see and identify with acts of sex and violence at the price of moral blindness. And as I read those words in Sidney's essay, I thought back to the uh, possible Plato illusion, as well as to the uh, possible uh, Augustinian illusion. 
After considering evidence from a number of films and looking in detail at Vertigo, Sidney concludes that Hitchcock is concerned, as he puts it, to demonstrate the moral truths of his Catholic upbringing. It would seem that Sidney and Alan could not be further apart. In a passing reference to Shadow of a Doubt uh, in that Vertigo essay, Sidney points out that the overt biblical reference in this case, which is the line, take a little wine for thy stomach's sake, it appears in the first of the two dinner scenes, comes from the fifth chapter of 1 Timothy, which is mainly about the treatment of widows. Hardly a coincidence for a film about a murderer of merry widows. I will be suggesting that there is something else in that chapter to which Hitchcock wants to draw our attention, something that links the title's allusions to one another, or possible allusions to one another, while also helping us see what ethical and political themes the film is addressing. Andre Bazin once asked Hitchcock whether he was a Jansenist. Hitchcock told him that he didn't know what that meant. Bazin <coughs> must have been wondering whether Hitchcock's Catholicism differed from that of Robert Bresson, a revered French filmmaker two years younger than Hitchcock and uh, often described by critics as a Jansenist. Jansenism was a 17th century Catholic Augustinian movement founded by Cornelius Jansen. Blaise Pascal was his most famous follower. Bresson's little book, Notes on Cinematography, is modeled on Pascal's pensée. In Diary of a Country Priest and Pickpocket, Bresson, at least on one popular reading, depicts characters beset by sin, a condition from which they can be saved only by divine grace. Late 20th century French theories of social rupture have their roots in a time and place in which Bresson was widely recognized as a great filmmaker. The transformation that occurs in the main character of Pickpocket is a rupture that cannot be explained in the standard dramatic way through the interaction of circumstance and character. Bresson carefully strips drama, suspense, and expressive acting from his works after Diary in order to place the turn, the conversion, or the event, if it happens in his film, as it does in Pickpocket, beyond narrative explanation. Hitchcock depicts a conversion uh, himself in his most overtly religious film, The Wrong Man, which appeared in 1956, three years uh, before Pickpocket. Of course, he does not suppress drama or suspense. His background is Jesuit, not Jansenist. He's a different kind of Augustinian, if he is one at all. If Shadow of a Doubt is an Augustinian film, it is not about how conversion works. It is about a conversion that doesn't happen about what it is like to remain in the grip of sin. Alan is right to say that young Charlie is presented at the end of the film as sinking back into conformity to the dull social world of sunny California. Conformity is a central category for Augustinians. Be not conformed to the world, says Romans 12.2, but be ye transformed. In Augustinian theology, conformity to the world names the basic orientation of fallen humanity, and transformation names a process of sanctification in which a sinner who has received the gift of faith participates in the perfection or amelioration of his or her dispositions. If we take the film to be an Augustinian critique of young Charlie's conformity to the Protestant bourgeois world of her time and place, 
what are we to make of the film's extensive use of Freudian imagery? Hitchcock may be exploring the relationship between two value-laden contrasts. Freud's between religious illusion and enlightenment, and Augustine's between sinful conformity to the world and spiritual transformation. The first term in each pair names a condition of incapacitation, illusion, or sin, a condition of incapacitation. A person or group in this condition is held to be unable to perceive something, think about it properly, or do something right or excellent. The second term in each pair, enlightenment in the Freudian case, spiritual transformation in the Augustinian one, is meant to name a beneficial process in which the incapacity would be mitigated or overcome. For Freud, of course, religion is a kind of incapacitation born of wishful thinking, whereas for Augustine, true religion is a process of beneficial transformation. Hitchcock is aware that Freudians and Augustinians typically view one another as incapacitated, as in need of diagnosis and remedy, in need of a kind of therapy rather than a more straightforward form of persuasion. So we don't just have a disagreements about religion. We also have conflicting diagnoses of our disagreements. The diagnoses treat the person whose behavior is being explained as someone who is blinded, deluded, or corrupted in some way. And this additional feature of our disagreements is part of what I'm saying uh, some of the cinematic conversations are about and how they bear on some of the social and political conflicts that Adam was hoping I might have something to say about uh, in his introduction. Sidney argues that Hitchcock's films are often concerned with perceptual incapacity, with what a person or group cannot see. And this has to do, on Sidney's interpretation, with a linkage between the Augustinian th theme of sin and an Augustinian critique of cinema, the very thing that, uh, that uh, Hitchcock is practicing. For Augustinians, ethical blindness and conformity to the world go hand in hand. What you see is determined by that to which your will is turned. Augustine's Confessions is a book of turns. Its shadows are created by a will turned away from God. Now we are in a position to sharpen our questions about young Charlie. What does she see? What does she fail to see? And why? What does this have to do with her return to conformism at the end of the film? And what does she care about most? That is, to what is her will directed at one or another time in the film? In, in its story. Allen writes that psychoanalysis in Hitchcock is as much a vehicle for exploiting romance, for implotting romance, I'm sorry, as, a form of ex, uh, uh, as it is a form of explanation that is valorized for its own sake. That seems right to me, psychoanalysis as a, a means of implotment. Hitchcock does not embrace Freudianism as a total worldview. Allen treats Freudianism as one among many features of a broader late romantic culture that Hitchcock inherited and transformed. Sidney treats it, in effect, as one set of tools for analyzing how sin operates in the human psyche. But notice, Allen's interest in Hitchcock's complicated way of exploring tensions between perversity and romantic ideals does not by itself conflict with Sidney's point about sin. A romantic ironist 
can use Freudian concepts for Augustinian purposes. That's at least possible. He just needs to give an Augustinian inflection to the tensions he exposes. What Freudianism has going for it, the Augustinian Hitchcock appears to think on uh, Sidney's interpretation, is an honest appreciation of the psyche as an egocentric system, largely determined by its individual history, whose natural attachments are sexual, ambiguous, and hard for the subject to understand or control. If there is such a thing as true religion in Hitchcock's view, it must be a remedy for the sort of egotism and perversity that Freud helps us understand. And it must be inherently hard for any actual ego to distinguish from its false semblances. Perhaps, perhaps Hitchcock thinks that re the religion of Santa Rosa, being a system of consolation rooted in wishful thinking and repression of truth, is one of those semblances and thus an illusion. If so, then Freudianism can help explain it without explaining away religion as such. I've now said enough to set up uh, a series of scenes from the film. My objective in examining these scenes is to see whether there is anything in them that conforms, uh, or rather conforms to uh, a possible Augustinian interpretation or confirms a, an Augustinian reading of the film. I should emphasize that I am not an Augustinian, uh, nor any kind of theist. The question is whether Hitchcock uh, is an Augustinian, uh, or rather, in, uh, in Alan's words, uh, somebody who is first and last an aesthete. What I've just done is open up the possibility that Hitchcock is, though very much an aesthete, and very much a selective user of Freudian tools all the time, uh, also very much an Augustinian. So over the credits in Shadow of a Doubt, we hear the Merry Widow Waltz. And maybe this would be a good time for people who have come in to find seats, because we're about to do some clips. Come on in. <clears throat> Hadn't realized. <laughs> the Merry Widow Waltz, which uh, we hear as Alan emphasizes in this quite dissonant uh, performance, uh, later passes telepathically between the two characters named Charlie. So we're going to start uh, there. Uncle Charlie, our serial murderer, remember, preys on rich widows. And in our first clip, we find him in Philadelphia. Let me go there. Told me not to mention they'd called. Wanted to surprise you. But I thought you'd like to know somehow. Yes, yes, of course. If they come back, you may show them in. Yes. You know, Mrs. Martin, it's very funny. They aren't exactly friends of mine. There's They've never the seen me. There's the cigar. That's odd, isn't it? It is odd. He's like in a say. vampire pose. Now that I'm here, I'll have to meet them. <laughs> I may even go out and meet them. And then again, I may not. Not yet. You go ahead with your nap. I'll pull down the blind. And as the shadow crosses his face, in conformity to the conventions of the vampire film, he rises. <laughs> Dandy. 
Um, the street number of his boarding house, as William Rothman points out in his, uh, his great book, uh, is 13. There's a pile of money next to him on the floor. That's of concern to the, to the, uh, uh, the woman there. After evading two detectives who are trailing him, uh, Charles telegraphs his sister Emma in Santa Rosa, saying that he intends to visit. He expre she expresses her excitement on hearing this news as her husband says, somebody's coming. <laughs> Their younger daughter, Anne, isn't able to take down the original phone message because, as she puts it, there is no sharpened pencil in the house. She says that she wants to, when she grows up, she wants to live in a house where there are lots of sharpened pencils. Her father is later described as being unable to drive. This is all Freudian innuendo. Emma has named her older daughter Charlotte after Uncle Charlie, and in our second clip, young Charlie is in a funk, and let's see what that looks like. Just have to wait for a miracle or something. Oh, now, Charlie, you're right, absolutely right. I'll figure out some way oh, and we... Oh, I don't believe in good intentions anymore. You get that? So, first a reference to a miracle, then she says that she doesn't believe in good intentions anymore. All I'm waiting for now is a miracle. Oh, Charlie. <laughs> Those back stairs are steep. What's the matter, Charlie? What's the matter, Joe? Well, it seems that... Uh... Oh, I've become a nagging old maid. Did you see that when her mother's shadow passed her face, she rose from the uh, reverse vampire position? And you went downtown that awful old hat you promised me you'd throw... There you go. So she too is in a vampire pose. Uh, she's been complaining about her boring life and her fragmented family. She says that she's given up. <clears throat> when her father promises to come up with something, she says that she doesn't believe in good intentions anymore. And uh, anyone who doesn't believe in uh, good intentions believes in what uh, Romans 3.8 calls doing evil that good may come of it. Boredom is an important category for Augustinians. Pascal describes it, <clears throat> pardon me, as, uh, as fear of being alone with yourself. Where you might have to confront meaninglessness and your own mortality and sin. Divertissement is his name for the entertainments we use to avoid boredom. Popular cinema can be viewed as a form of diversion. It might be that Bresson thought of it that way. Hitchcock, if he has the same concern, disguises his critique of it as entertainment. He is the master of suspense and famous for his wit. His teachers were Jesuits who traditionally looked on theater as a school for virtue. The Jansenists were opposed to theater as such two different kinds of Augustinian. Hitchcock does not reject theater as the Pascalian Bresson does, but Hitchcock movies, Hitchcock's movies might be partly about, as uh, Sidney suggests, why we go to the movies and what we fail to see. He expects his critique to escape the notice of most viewers if he is offering it, and if this were not so, the critique would be false. Young Charlie decides that her uncle is the one, as she puts it, to save her family. 
It seems to me that language like this in a Hitchcock film is never idle, and that's because it's hard to think of any detail in any Hitchcock film that is idle. Young Charlie is motivated by a desire for diversion and has selected what her own dialogue uh, reveals to be a false savior. Hitchcock shows us something, expecting us not to notice it, and diagnoses our blindness. In this film, he's setting, setting us up to identify with young Charlie while condemning us for sharing her blindness. He wants to divert us from our diversions. His films are ironically diverting. See me heading out on that limb? Young Charlie heads uh, off to telegraph her uncle at just the moment he is telegraphing Emma. Uncle Charlie is coming to Santa Rosa. We can see him arriving in our next clip, uh, which William Rothman has analyzed well. So far we have this enormous effusion of smoke as if the evil were coming from the East Coast being brought into the otherwise perfectly pure Santa Rosa. That's a ruse of the narrative. <laughs> Darkness passes over the whole crowd. Here's Uncle Charlie. Initially limp. He sees young Charlie. He becomes erect. Watch the king. Who are you? Charlie. Oh, at first I didn't know you. I thought you were sleeping. Okay. As Rothman emphasizes in the chapter on this film, In the Murderous Gaze, the phallic cane points directly at her mouth before passing beyond her. This is our first hint that the, the first of many hints that the Newton family is incestuous. When Uncle Charlie greets Emma in the next scene, the brother and sister are shot in accordance with the romantic convention, uh, the romantic cinematic convention of reunited lovers. The innuendo is so subtle that it is easy to miss on first viewing, yet Hitchcock has already raised the possibility by this point of two incestuous relationships centered on Uncle Charlie, and he will later raise another. We are uh, entering ethically dangerous territory here, which uh, was nicely mapped out by Robin Wood. After dinner at Emma's house, Uncle Charlie gives the, children's, uh, the children of the Newton family gifts. His gift for young Charlie is a ring the scene echoes marriage proposals in film romances. Cinematically, the two Charlies are betrothed. Young Charlie notices an inscription in the ring. The ring once belonged to someone else. The evening newspaper includes a story about the Merry Widow murderer. There are two suspects, one on each coast. Uncle Charlie tears the story out of the newspaper. Young Charlie senses that he's hiding something. Perhaps the missing page has something to do with it. On a visit to the local bank, where Uncle Charlie deposits $40,000 of ill-gotten uh, cash, he is introduced to Mrs. Potter, a merry widow who flirts with him significantly in 
young Charlie's presence. Another pair of detectives pretending to be conducting a study of the average American family <laughs> drops by the Newton residence to interview the family and take photographs. The photographer points his tripod directly at young Charlie. When photographers appear in films, by convention they are often stand-ins for the director. If so, Hitchcock may be confessing his own desire for his leading lady, a sort of obsession, uh, in his case, documented by his biographers. In any event, confessing is what Augustinians do. Uncle Charlie's picture is taken, so he demands the detective's film. The, de the detective gives him a roll of film, but we later discover that he palmed the roll that includes Charlie's image and sent it to the chief investigators. This does not, however, lead to Charlie's capture. Film can capture the truth, but it is useless to all those who lack the eyes or the will to see, and this includes, apparently, the authorities. The other detective, Graham, is attracted to young Charlie. She accepts a date with him and lies to a friend whom she had agreed to see that evening. And we can see what ensues in our next clip. I'd like to ask another favor. Could I borrow your daughter for this evening? I'd like to look around the town a little. And? Charlie. Anne would be better. Anne knows everything about everybody. Charlie. Well, if uh, Charlie doesn't mind. I don't <coughs> mind. Swell. Goodbye, then, Mrs. Newton. Goodbye. Half past six? Half past six. Okay, goodbye. Bye. Bye, Mr. Saunders. Bye. Goodbye. He seems like a nice young man. I thought you were going to the movies with Catherine. Oh, I'll tell her I don't feel well or something. So here's their date. It's at the Gunner's Grill. I'll call attention to the soldiers later. Wanted to get in our house. Please, that's what it is. What do you want with us? Now we see that this is all happening under the sign of the Bank of America. You've done nothing but lie. You probably didn't want to take me out at all tonight the way I thought you did. You just wanted to ask me a lot of questions. Have I asked you a lot of questions? Have I? All right, I'm a detective. Pretty bad one. A pretty bad one. I won't listen to me. Why should I when you lied to me? I had to. When I came here to this town to find the man, I hadn't counted on you. I hadn't counted on your mother or your family. Can you hear this in the back? Can you hear the dialogue well enough? Good. So I think Hitchcock expects most viewers to ignore young Charlie's lie because they identify with the attractive protagonist, just as he expects them to ignore the Cary Grant character's lie at the beginning of North by Northwest. It's not accidental that the Grant character in that film is in advertising, and nor is it accidental, I think, that this scene plays out under the sign of the Bank of America. During the date, Graham admits that he isn't doing a survey. He is a detective and there's a man on the loose. Uncle Charlie might be the man. Young Charlie, who has just lied to one of her friends, uh, is incensed that 
the detective has lied to her. Well, what was that story in the newspaper? When she searches for it, Charlie tells Anne that she's looking for a recipe, another lie. Anne advises her to look up the recipe in the paper at the library, and young Charlie rushes across town to go to the library, discovers there that the story uh, in the paper is about the Merry Widow murderer, and that the initials of the third victim match the inscription in her ring. Young Charlie now sleeps throughout the day, which is what vampires do in the movies. Her sister refuses to sit next to Uncle Charlie at dinner. We are not told why, but if, we had paid, if we've paid attention to the incest theme, we can guess. Uncle Charlie uh, then asks for a bottle of wine, sparkling burgundy, saying, take a little wine for thy stomach's sake. That's that line uh, from 1 Timothy. But there's barely time to notice the verse. The dialogue keeps moving. Charles mentions a loaded cane. Young Charlie hints that her uncle needs to be leaving Santa Rosa soon revealing her suspicions to him, but not the rest of the family. Shocked that she knows his story, he compares decadent rich women that he has known to wheezing animals, asking whether they deserve to live. They're alive, they're human beings, young Charlie protests. Her father and a friend of his are mystery buffs, played for comic relief, and they're imagining ways in which they could murder one another. Taking offense at this, young Charlie leaves in a huff. Her uncle follows her. They end up in a bar where she foolishly returns the ring to him, and uh, that's the next clip. Now, I just, I'm just, I'm not going to talk through this, but I want you to try to see what you can see as the clip unfolds. You've heard some little things about me. Well, I guess you're a woman of the world enough to overlook them. You're the head of your family, Charlie. Anyone can see that. I'm not so old. I've been chasing around the globe since I was 16. I guess I've done some pretty foolish things, made some pretty foolish mistakes. Nothing serious, just foolish. start imagining things. How could you do such things? You're my uncle, my mother's brother. We thought you were the most wonderful man in the world. Most wonderful and the best. Charlie, what do you know? I'm sorry I was so long. We're awful busy. Is it? Ain't it beautiful? I just die for a ring like that. Yes, sir, for a ring like that, I just about die. I love jewelry, real jewelry. You notice I didn't even have to ask if it was real. You can tell. I can. Bring me another brandy. Yes, sir. Sit down. Sit down. something, don't you? You think you're the clever little girl who knows something. There's so much you don't know. So much. What do you know, really? You're just an ordinary little girl living in an ordinary little town. You wake up every morning of your life and you know perfectly well that there's nothing in the world to trouble you. You go through your ordinary little day 
And at night you sleep your untroubled, ordinary little sleep filled with peaceful, stupid dreams. And I brought you nightmares. Or did I? Or was it a silly, inexpert little lie? You live in a dream. You're a sleepwalker, blind. How do you know what the world is like? Do you know the world is a foul sty? Do you know if you ripped the fronts off houses, you'd find swine? The world's a hell. What does it matter what happens in it? Wake up, Charlie. Use your wits. Learn something. You going, Charlie? <laughs> okay, this uh, ripping the fronts off of houses to reveal swine is exactly what Hitchcock has been doing. There's a possible connection to Ralph Waldo Emerson here, which I'd be happy to explore later if you want me to. Uh, keep in mind in that clip you've just seen, again, the soldiers. Again, I'll come back to this. On Sunday after church, the two detectives show up. Graham asks, uh, and to tell him the Dracula story. The photographer detective tells um, young Charlie that his photo of Uncle Charlie was not destroyed after all. Soon it will be shown to witnesses, but later that day the other suspect runs into an airplane propeller. And uh, let's just say that the case is closed. The authorities fail to heed the truths recorded on film. They do not care to put two and two together. Now Uncle Charlie is off the hook unless his namesake, young Charlie, spills the beans, and he realizes that it is now in his interest to kill her, and she realizes that too. He twice tries to kill her, the second time by trapping her in the garage while running the car engine. This might be the first allusion to extermination by carbon monoxide in film. What Hitchcock knew about gas vans and gas chambers by 1942 is uncertain, but as part of the immigrant community in Hollywood, and as someone who had worked in the German film industry and had many connections to it, he was well positioned to know quite a bit. Three years after filming Shadow, Hitchcock flew to London to advise a team of military documentarians on how to film the liberation of the camps. He told them to use long takes rather than his own style of montage. He thought that the long takes would make it seem real to the viewers and not interfered with by the, by the uh, photographers. While young Charlie is recovering from near suffocation, Uncle Charlie gives a triumphant speech to the Ladies Association. And just before a party is given in his honor at the Newton House, uh, Young Charlie is frantically looking for the ring, and she finds it just as the guests uh, assemble downstairs. And uh, now I'm going to show you the longest of my clips, which uh, I will interrupt a bit while it's playing. Um, it's the ending of the movie, basically, the entire ending. Now, now, Mr. Oakley, I thought champagne was only for battleships. <laughs> <laughs> and none for me, oh, thanks, yeah. and none, I'm sure, for my wife. But okay, so there's our preacher and the community. Um, we know that he's a Protestant because he's a teetotaler, and he's married. I take that to be a very significant sentence coming out of his mouth. This is the person who could conceivably be a prophetic presence in the town.
from Hitchcock's point of view, basically saying, we hope you won't notice that we're here. I'd like to propose a toast to... Isn't Charlie coming down? Well, she'll be down in a moment, Mrs. Potter. Oh, don't take... That's Mrs. Potter, and she is the next uh, prospective victim <coughs> being served um, these sandwiches by, uh, by Emma. Gentlemen, I don't know why I make tomato. They always soak through the bread when they've been standing. Try one of these. It's just whole wheat bread and cream cheese. It's the paprika makes it pink. Mr. Green? Mrs. Green, what would you like? Thank, thank you. I think I'd like to propose a toast, too. That's uh, the banker nicknamed Mr. Green. Emmy. To our distinguished visitor, to the man who's made the best speech heard in this town for years. To that very good fellow, Mr. Oakley. Thank you, sir. Oh. Herbie? Thank you. We don't get many American speakers, Mr. Oakley. Seems like foreigners make the best talkers. Ah, here she is. Now for my toast. One of the great shots in the movie that zoom in to her. And, and of course, it's, again, cinematic convention of a betrothal scene, a sort of you know, engagement party sort of thing, or uh, wedding reception. And uh, except that she has the ring on the other hand, and she's coming down, and of course it's meant for her, uh, she's, she means for him to notice that he, she has the ring again. Charlie? <clears throat> You're just in time for a farewell toast. I hate to break the news to you like this, but tomorrow I must leave Santa Rosa. Not forever. Not forever. If that isn't the strangest coincidence, why, I was planning to go to San Francisco myself tomorrow morning. <laughs> oh, Emmy, darling, I didn't mean to spoil your fun tonight. I got a letter today and have to catch the early morning train. Uh, Emma's very distraught. So part of what you have to try to figure out is why this degree of emotional response to the possibility that her brother is going to leave town. I miss you, Amy. But I want you all to know that I'll always think of this lovely town as a place of hospitality and kindness <laughs> and homes, homes. But I can't bear it if you go, Charles. Oh, Emmy, I'll be back. I've arranged with Dr. Phillips for our little memorial for the children. No. It isn't any of the things you've done. It's just the idea that we were together again. I'm sorry. But you see, we were so close growing up. And then Charles went away, and I got married, and... But then you know how it is. So to forget to you, your husband's wife. Did you get that? You almost forget your you. You, you're your husband's wife. And of course, the other women in the room are almost embarrassed at the degree of response she's giving. Um, we were so close when we were growing up. She says. We'll be looking for you, Mr. Oakley. We feel you're one of us. Don't we, Margaret? Indeed we do. And I want to thank you on behalf of our club members. And bless you for your gift to our hospital. The children will bless you, too, in all the years to come. Thank you, sir. Excuse me, sir, but I, I can hear the train coming now. Good job, Herbie. <laughs> I can hear the train coming. Excuse me. Notice the cane in this crucial scene. Uh, it's almost as if Hitchcock cut it and repositioned it just to make sure we get the point. There's Charlie now dressed in widow's black. Better get aboard, Charles. All right. It's later, Herman. Goodbye, everybody. Roger, and come see the train. Come on, Charlie. You can see the get off. <laughs>
But he doesn't say you can see me get on. He says you can see me get off. All right. I want to see the rooms, the private ones. I've seen first, I stepped in two uppers and one lower. Goodbye, Joe. Goodbye, Charles. Goodbye, Emmy. Goodbye. And don't forget to write, Charles. I will. You write, too. I'll send you my address. Don't jump on the seats, Roger. Roger would not tell you. There's Mrs. Potter. Porter, there's one more bag. I think it got taken in the other car. Would you get it, please? Yes, sir. Charlie, the train's going to start. I don't want to get carried away. Oh, boy, maybe it's too late. Maybe I'll have to go along. There's plenty of time. You run along. We'll follow. Charlie. Just a minute. I want you to know I think you were right to make me leave. It's best for your mother, best for all of us. You saw what happened to her last night. She's not very strong, you know. I don't think she could stand the shock. I remember once when she was a little girl. So... Oh, the train's moving, oh. Uncle Charlie. Listen, Charlie. I want you to forget all about me. Forget that I ever came to Santa Rosa. Oh, let me go, Uncle Charlie. Let me go. I've got to do this, Charlie. So long as you know what you do about me. Let it get a little faster. Just a little faster. Faster. Now. The return of the Merry Widow Waltz, and then the funeral. Significantly, these two characters are outside the church, a son that she can be proud of. but within the Brave, Protestant church, generous, kindly. it's just a With eulogy the for the Uncle John. I couldn't have faced it without someone who knew. Came into our community and our lives were I did know more, I couldn't tell you. I know. Do you love him most? He thought the world was a horrible place. Couldn't have been very happy ever. No. He didn't trust people. He seemed to hate them. He hated the whole world. You know, he said that people like us had no idea what the world was really like. Well, it's not quite as bad as that. But sometimes it needs a lot of watching. It seems to go crazy every now and then. Like your Uncle Charlie. The beauty of their souls, the sweetness of their characters live on with us forever. Okay. There's a hint in that last line of Hitchcock's uh -huh. cinema cinematic response to horrendous evil, which is a close observation of it. But whose evil have we been watching here? Uh, the answer cannot simply be Uncle Charlie's. The opening scenes trade on a contrast between shadowy Philadelphia and sunny Santa Rosa. The killer is identified with an urban setting. His evil invades Santa Rosa from the outside, as we saw in the uh, train arrival scene with the black smoke. Young Charlie strikes us initially as pure. She is a naive, good-natured American girl looking to add some excitement to her life. Through no fault of her own, she looks for it in the wrong place. The resulting confrontation with evil marks the end of her innocence. Hitchcock expects us to identify with her and to feel relief when her uncle's death returns Santa Rosa to its prior condition of peaceful re rectitude. 
but Hitchcock's use of Freudian symbols and cinematic conventions hints at a more troubling story. What happened back when a younger Emma cared for her brother after his first bike ride resulted in an accident that left him bedridden for months? This question is all the more disturbing when we consider that Emma is also the name of Hitchcock's mother who lay dying in England while the film was being shot. What is he saying about her? Earlier in the film, there is a hint that the head injury Charles sustained in the bike accident marks the moment at which he turned into his present self. But one's first bike ride is a stock Freudian symbol for loss of virginity. What did Charles and Emma do? How exactly did she care for him? The All-American family is a sty riddled with incest. The murderous uncle's character was shaped in sunny Santa Rosa, where his sister Emma cared for him as an injured boy. The caring seemed to have involved her mouth and his phallus. Now young Charlie and her younger sister have been drawn into the slime, learning all the while to repress their awareness of what is going on around them, as victims of sexual abuse are often wont to do. And this ties back to the uh, possible allusion to Jung. Hitchcock is addressing an extremely disturbing topic in full awareness that some members of his audience will have experienced this sort of thing. And he is smuggling it all past the censors in a false bottomed suitcase. He's using the Freudian cinematic vocabulary as a code for getting all of this past the censors. It allows him to address topics they would not have him address more overtly. How much of this do we see? Hitchcock expects many of his viewers to be blind in roughly the way that young Charlie is. He has shown her lying. She is pretty and naive, so we look past her lies. He has enticed us into rooting for her. Perhaps we miss that she's trying to get Uncle Charlie to board a train that will also carry his likely next victim. We don't ask why young Charlie fails to take in the significance of Mrs. Potter's presence on the train. Our heroine is, has not given a single conscious thought to her uncle's potential victims. Hitchcock believes that his American viewers, like young Charlie, mainly care about being nice and making their mothers happy. They also care a little bit about the excitement they get from the experience of perversion and perverse desire. That's another thing, but there's more going on here. We don't want to discover that the two Charlies are spiritual twins, that Santa Rosa is no less fallen than Philadelphia, that young Charlie's blindness is our blindness. Well, it's time to return to that reference to 1 Timothy 5 in the second dinner scene. As Sidney points out, that chapter of Paul's letter is mainly about the proper treatment of widows, but what exactly does it say? Verse 3 teaches that widows who are truly widows, that is, widows who are bereft of family support, should be honored. But verse 6 condemns the widow who lives for pleasure, the sort of widow Uncle Charlie preys upon, as someone who is dead even while she lives. Verses 11 through 16 voice concerns about younger widows who allow, quote, their sexual desires to alienate them from Christ. And these are among the women that Uncle Charlie refers to as fat, wheezing animals. From Hitchcock's point of view, if there is truth in what Uncle Charlie says about widows, it was expressed first here. There's one more verse from chapter 5 of First Timothy that appears to bear on the significance of Shadow of a Doubt. It is verse 20 which teaches that, quote, sin must be rebuked 
so that others also may fear. Sin must be rebuked so that others also may fear. It could have been the film's epigraph if Hitchcock were less subtle. Once young Charlie realizes that her uncle is indeed a murderer, she refrains from publicly rebuking him. This, it, if this is a Hitchcock, if this is an Augustinian film, then this is her mortal sin of omission. She does not warn others that there is reason to fear him. Her main objective is to protect her mother from the truth about Uncle Charlie and to protect her family from the dishonor and embarrassment of having him arrested in Santa Rosa. The family's honor and surface tranquility must be preserved at all costs. An Augustinian critique of this social world would go as follows. Young Charlie's way of caring about surface tranquility, about niceness, is what corrupts her life. It's at least part of what corrupts her life. It casts the shadow that causes her blindness. It is why she does not see the danger in which she is placing Mrs. Potter and others like her. For Augustinians, what you care about most, what you love most, is the essence of your character, the determinant of what you can perceive, infer, and do. Conformity to the world is rooted in disordered caring. Disordered love makes the world go dark. Freud is helpful in explaining the consequences and their connections with perversity, but the root of the darkness, if this is an Augustinian film, goes deeper than Freud can fathom. If there is a single key to unlocking the meaning of shadow of a doubt, verse 20 of 1 Timothy, is, uh, chapter 5, is where it is hidden. What lock is this key meant to open? Hitchcock has made a film during an eventful year for horrendous evil in Europe. If this is a Catholic film about a Protestant bourgeoisie of nice liars, merry widows, incestuous matrons, bankers without conscience, and ministers without prophecy, it is also an Englishman's film about America's <clears throat> tardiness in joining the war. Let me explain. In the first dinner scene, Hitchcock is careful to imply that the story is set in the months immediately preceding Pearl Harbor in 1941. Once we focus on this, <clears throat> our attention is drawn to the many American soldiers we see in the film. They appear during the date sequence, which centers on lying during young Charlie's two dashes through town, both of which involve uh, jaywalking, and when Graham asks Anne to tell the Dracula story. Soldiers are also much in evidence during the bar scene. We see three soldiers just before the Germans <laughs> enter the bar. During their tense exchange there, remember I ask you, what do you see? During their tense exchange there, a soldier repeatedly leans out of a booth, eventually gets up to let someone out of the booth, and then returns to his seat. As the soldier rises, Charlie says, that is, Uncle Charlie says, anyone can see that. When the two Charlies are shot in profile, they frame the soldier. Throughout Uncle Charlie's nihilistic speech about sleepwalking and blindness, the soldier is made visible to us. When young Charlie leaves the bar, she has to make her way past three more soldiers who are on their way in. Hitchcock is asking, I think, and this, this point might swing free from the other issue about how Augustinian the movie is. But I think Hitchcock is asking, why are all these soldiers here in Santa Rosa? Why are they hanging out in bars, diverting themselves, 
when Jews are being exterminated, much of Europe is under Nazi rule, and Britain's fate remains uncertain. The soldiers are here because the American public cares about what young Charlie cares about and is blind, even while watching this movie, to her blindness and complicity. So here we have a film that, if my intuitions are right, is about the failure of the American business elite the American church and the average American family to recognize and respond appropriately to horrendous evils in the world. A film alleging that the American public's ultimate and therefore ultimately corrupting concern is to maintain its delusions of domestic purity and tranquility. A film intent on laying bare the motives and consequences of failing to rebuke evil publicly so that others too may fear. A film in which the tendency of nice, ordinary people to exhibit merely inert concern for the victims of horrendous evil condemns those victims to death. A film charging the audience with blinding itself, not least of all, in its choice of entertainments, in its way of watching entertainments, to young Charlie's blindness, and with complicity in the horrors its government has been unwilling to face and prevent. Of course, my intuitions might not be right. I don't claim to have settled uh, the interpretation of this film, let alone the dispute between Allen's approach to Hitchcock and Sidney's. But I have tried to show what an Augustinian interpretation of Shadow of a Doubt would look like at the level of detail. I have highlighted some details in the film that appear to confirm such a reading, and I have suggested that Augustinian social criticism and romantic irony might be easier to combine than we have assumed them to be. Thank you very much. Yes, um, a quite r remarkable uh, talk, um, and uh, one that um, I will have to think about for longer than I have a period to formulate uh, an adequate response to. Um, it's always struck me that um, Shadow of a Doubt is, is a, a, a deeply serious film. And I had trouble. It was one of the films that I had trouble with reconciling to um, the decision or the, 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 the take that I uh, formulated on Hitchcock, which, as you say, um, characterizes him as primarily an E.C. therefore an amoralist at heart. And uh, I was aware of the uh, tradition of criticism, obviously. There's an important tradition of criticism. In fact, it was the first criticism of Hitchcock. And the, historically, the odd thing is that, the, of course, the French critics uh, took Hitchcock as the preeminent auteur. And uh, they saw the key to his, uh, the thematic significance of his work as lying in the, in, in, in the form taken by his work. And in a sense, you are, your, your talk is, is directly um, uh, uh, in, in line with that tradition. But what they were responding to was the, uh, the response that they were having was to uh, views of Hitchcock, which saw him as a, a superficial uh, technical uh, expert, um, an expert in manipulating and orchestrating audience emotions through the mastery of form and technique. Um, uh, and those two views of Hitchcock are so profoundly opposed to one another. I think more, even more profoundly opposed to one another than the view that I have of Hitchcock and the view that you do. Um, it seems as if, it seemed as if you, you had either a, 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 a really superficial entertainer as, 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 the, as, as, as the figure of Hitchcock, or this 
Hollywood director, which nobody had really taken seriously before, as somebody who was actually a profound meditator on moral problems and the human condition. Um, I think that the so that so so the question I I, I think the question for me um, is uh, is is that that there are certain works and and this is one of them um, that seem to really demand um, uh, a, a level of response that goes beyond that of um, uh, of even. As even the sophisticated um, and uh, and um, uh, n uh, the so e even beyond uh, the sophisticated amoral or aesthetes position, um, I I found the uh, analysis that you gave of the film um, um, compelling uh, in its in its outline. I think that the uh, uh, that Hitchcock is, in, in a sense, you were uh, 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 arguing that uh, the key to this film lies in the uh, reversibility of these ostensibly uh, um, uh, 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 op opposite moral positions, um, which is which is which is what what I would argue is consistent with all Hitchcock's films. In other words, the sense in which the the uh, the uh, figure who is conventionally positioned as morally perverse uh, is endowed with certain kinds of this it, certain kinds of uh, certain kinds of redeeming qualities, and the figure who is the figure who is in the uh, the figure who's placed in the ostensible, ostensible position of, of of conformity and. Uh, the uh, obvious locus of identification for the audience is one who is, who is uh, in fact, a more problematic uh, 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 character. Um, but uh, you argued that that reversibility was not simply one of aesthetic play or, as, or, or, as, or, a, or a teasing of the audience uh, with uh, some kind of Taking them outside of their comfort zone and calling to them, to calling, calling, calling upon them to question some of their conventional or, or orthodox allegiances, you were pushing that reversibility into, I think, uh, areas where uh, something, uh, uh, something more, uh, uh, more uh, profound, or at least arguing that that Hitchcock is actually. Uh, 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 seeking to to uh, uh, address the moral condition of his audience uh, or the moral sensibilities of his audience. Um, I think that that so so I, spe I suppose my question would be for you is is I'm persuaded that this film does that. I think this is something about uh, shadow of a doubt. Um, I think it's this it's it's partly the the way in which he doesn't. Uh, um, uh, uh, well, well, two things. One about the the incestuous nature of the family, which is you, which you point out, and the second is the, the is in a, in a way the the absence of the the, the 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 Uncle Charlie figure is an unusual figure for Hitchcock too. There's a sort of seriousness. There is a seriousness about the the uh, character of Uncle Charlie as well in what he has to say and his mode of tipo. He hasn't got the flamboyance and the the, the, and the the kind of uh, he hasn't got the conventional allure of the dandy figure in Hitchcock. So there's something there's something uh, 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 the, 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 the 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 flaws in the convention the, the flaws in the conventional uh, society that's portrayed are deep. And 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 as you and I think brilliantly point out, I mean that the the code the Freudian coding. Is at once uh, a, 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 a disguise and an index of that depth, and then at the same time, the Uncle Charlie figure has a level of, of um, uh, unlike say Robert Walker in Strangers on a Train, or even Norman Bates in in Psycho, he has a level of um, gravitas to the character. So I, I wonder. My question <laughs> actually would be, 
uh, I wonder how much this uh, you feel that this uh, 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 depth is discernible across Hitchcock's oeuvre, or whether or not this is something to do with the circumstance, because Hitchcock himself singled out this film, it was extremely important for Hitchcock, um, and whether or not it's a combination of the writers and Hitch you know, the, the, the time, the writers and Hitchcock, um, there's, there's, a, there's a, uh, 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 a, uh, an achievement of depth in this film that is actually rare. The depth, the kind of depth that you're seeking to uh, uh, unearth. It's a greater depth, you think, than is achieved in Vertigo, Rear Window, or Psycho? No, I, I, I wouldn't say that those all have the level of political implication that I'm attributing to this film. But I think the depth is there. Um, I think that the... Yes, I mean... I can't argue with that, either of those four films, actually. I think that probably, probably the films you've... Uh, uh, th th those four films, certainly, I think. So it just, uh, I'm thinking in Psycho of the, uh, the shot that immediately precedes the shower sequence. Sidney calls attention to this. So the Bates character takes a painting off of the wall and then looks through an aperture as a sort of wire before he then becomes the the character of the murderer. Um, the painting he takes off the wall is a painting of, uh, of the apocryphal story of Susanna. Um, so that makes a biblical connection and it thematizes the nature of the claim being made about sin and its relation to the voyeur. And of course, the Bates character is looking through an aperture in just the way that is meant to suggest the identification of him with the director, as well as with the, with the audience that will, is about to view the scene. That's pretty serious uh, self reflection on the connection between human evil the, and the reasons we make films and, and watch them and how complicated that is. It's a very, that's pretty deep. Um, so I, and I think it actually goes back into a tradition that Hitchcock might have in mind with Dreyer in the background. What I'm thinking of is the um, the moments in the Passion of Joan of Arc, in which, well, you know, when when uh, when Joan is is in the Ecce Homo scene, and what does the guard do when he's tormenting her? Well, he does this. That is. Uh, he, it's the same motif that I, uh, I'm, I'm imagining Hitchcock right. picked up from Dreyer's film and, went, uh, and, and thought of himself as continuing a, you know, here, here's one of the other great Christian directors and one of the great directors also engaging in a kind of self-reflection on what is involved in witnessing suffering of this sort, what, what draws us to it. What are the ethical ambiguities and uh, what's going on here? And of course, then the Joan figure is led into the torture chamber where the torture devices um, echo film equipment. So there's one device that, that looks like the sprockets in a film projector, and, there, and then the large torture wheel echoes the um, Echoes the uh, cinema reel, so the uh, there's a serious tradition of Christian filmmaking reflection on the connection between voyeurism and cinema, and the suffering 
uh, the suffering of the people uh, who are seen. There's, and we know that uh, Hitchcock um, um, drew on, on Joan of Arc from, uh, from the way in which he, he um, uh, uses the, um, uh, uh, refers to it in, in, in murder. Uh, so that's not, an, that's not an implausible right. connection. As, as for Rear Window, um, they are the biblical references to the Salome dance, which, um, which the Grace Kelly character makes explicit reference to. She will dance the, the dance of the, of the veils, and she makes some reference to once an hour or like clockwork. So that uh, this is, you know, uh, uh, that that uh, I I don't think Shadow uh, just to put it simply, I don't think Shadow of a Doubt is a complete outlier in the oeuvre. No. I think there are uh, so even a, in a much more lighthearted film like North by Northwest, uh, you have that theme of Cary Grant as a liar introduced at the beginning of the film. And he is the one, isn't he, who looks through the aperture uh, in, you know, what are those devices in the, you know, uh, you know the automatic camera uh, that, or telescope the, that allows at the, you. At the, at the, at the binoculars, yeah. The binoculars, uh, he looks up at the, the, binoculars, the pay binoculars, it's, right. And the faces on Mount Rushmore. Right, so he's the one now in that, in being identified with the director, and yeah. so I, it seems to me that that motif runs through quite a few of the films. Uh, we've got several of them already. Uh, I don't, I don't know how far that thought can be taken. I don't know, I, I don't know what the full range is. But that's a much more light-hearted film, of course, right. as you say in your book. Um, but even in that case, I think there are little explosive devices <laughs> placed um, that are meant to go off uh, on reflection, uh, triggered by some of the other movies and expectations about what certain recurring motifs mean to Hitchcock. Right, I mean, I, I was also thinking uh, uh, your, your, your analysis of, of Shadow of Doubt also reminded me a little bit, although he doesn't explicitly um, use a theological uh, framework, is of Mark Crispin Miller's analysis of suspicion uh, as, the, as, the, uh, as a film that's uh, 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 addressing um, uh, and, um, and, and ultimately cri criticizing uh, uh, the, na the naive spectator of uh, who is uh, expected to be complicit in the uh, in the um, in the melodramatic fantasies of the heroine of the film, um, and uh, uh, it, 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 it seemed to me that um, uh, uh, there was a there's a there's a, some close analogies between that and, and the and your own uh, reading of Shadow of a Doubt as a, as a ultimately as a, as a as a film. Uh, um, uh, you know, it's 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 a sense in which it's not simply that Hitchcock is 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 the, 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 is, 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 is yes, that simply put it simply the the the, the criti critiquing the the the, 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 the film is imp implicating a, cer a certain spectator um, uh, and um, invi inviting for the a, dis a discerning a reader. Uh, a, a view that requires them to uh, uh, question their own, um, uh, you know, their own their own relationship to what it is that they're seeing, and the kind of pleasure, the kind of superficial pleasures that they might um, uh, normally get from uh, a, a melodrama pitting good against evil. I mean, let, let me just say one thing about how this, uh, I think connects in a positive way to your category of romantic irony. So uh, if we take seriously the idea that Hitchcock belongs to a late romantic culture in which those very aspects of melodrama are present and in which the extremely sophisticated nature of the irony has to do with 
the way the finite or contingent is related to the ideal, that leaves room for exactly this sort of possibility. So the, um, the one needn't say at the end of the day that he is, Hitchcock is simply an aesthete. That tradition includes people who are ambivalent about their aestheticism and using romantic irony to get very complicated relationships between contingency, perversity, and so on, and ideals. And all, I guess all I'm saying is that within that very interpretive context, these moves can be made. You don't need to then say that, sum it all up by saying that Hitchcock is first and last an aesthete, or merely one. Uh, room within that interpretive frame to allow for more complexity on right. that point. Uh, I, and I suppose one could probably say the same thing about other aesthetes like Wild, for example. I mean, the, the Wild isn't, isn't in, in Wild's aestheticism doesn't just reside in, a, in an amoral framework, but there's actually uh, a, a lessons delivered. I mean, yeah, I agree with that. Maybe we should open out for uh, questions and, and discussion at this point. Yeah. I don't know if this is a question, but a comment about, um, I mean, I know very little about film, but listening to your conversation ab about this issue of uh, visuality and the problem of watching that, that you're addressing with regard to Hitchcock is actually, uh, um, it's, it's a problem in, in Augustine's Confessions. Right? I mean, this is a major theme in the text is he's having a conversation with God and we're just kind of there watching and, and we, we're, we're drawn into it. We're observing this conversation, and we forget that we're actually there. And he, he turns to the reader at times and, and will say, oh, well, you know, you're here with me, and I'm having this conversation. And, and, then, and, and, and also, there's this uh, great passage, it's, um, I mean, book three, book four, I forget, where he, he describes his friend going with him to the games. Oh, no, sorry, not going with him, going with others to the games, and his friend not wanting to watch, because you shouldn't watch sin because you're drawn into it and you take pleasure in it. And ultimately his friend opens his eyes and, is, and he becomes kind of engrossed in it and, and he ends up becoming a sinful person from watching sin. So I just, uh, this isn't so much a question, but uh, I guess one comment I would raise is a very broad issue is um, not to suggest that you've d d divided up uh, Jeff, uh, kind of Augustine and Freud as if they're kind of opposites. There's, in a way, it's very hard to read Augustine today. I mean, this is something like in the classroom, if you teach the confessions, it's hard for people not to giggle at Augustine and, and read him in a kind of Freudian way. So there's, there's ways that Augustinian, uh, Augustinian thought's kind of broad, but there's, there's, there's certain kind of aspects of the confessions that are so familiar to us because of these deep links be between psychoanalysis and Augustinian kind of like the, the notion of the self that's there, that's hidden, that needs to be kind of addressed. Um, that I guess it, I'm, it's not a question, but I'm, I'm wondering to what extent, uh, uh, to make a kind of extreme question, how could he not, in order to kind of con convey these Augustinian notions, how could he not use Freud? Because there's such a deep, like a in his <laughs> own particular context, especially, yeah. where uh, you know which which directors who have something serious to say in the 30s and 40s in the U.S. or in Britain are not thinking about <laughs> uh, Freud. Uh, now, which which serious theologians aren't in that period aren't thinking about Freud. I mean, this is, and many of them Augustinians thinking about how to how exactly they can appropriate Freud without becoming without adopting a total Freudian worldview. I mean, I, the 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 sort of move that someone like Paul Ricoeur later makes in Freud and philosophy is is you know suggesting the same sort of relation between Augustinian theology and uh, and Freudian 
explanation that I was saying might be a possibility for interpreting Hitchcock. It's harder to get at Hitchcock on these points than it is for the for the theologians who are, you know, discoursing at this on you know very directly and at length. Yes, in the back. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a longish question, so I wrote it down on my phone. But um, it's a response to your talk, but also it being part of a larger body of work that is textual analysis of Hitchcock films, which, if I am correct, and this is my guess, it is the single largest body of work in film studies, which is textual analysis of Hitchcock. Um, and in that context, I was wondering, I have a question about method, and maybe for you to reflect on the paper, and this could be a question for Richard as well, which is that um, given the rather explicit and theatrical nature of phallic symbols in Hitchcock's films, or shadow play in Hitchcock's films, it seems to me that Hitchcock himself is doing some kind of ersatz Freudian interpretation of the plots that he's presenting. So in, if you go along with that, I would ask if you would clarify or categorize your own presentation or textual analysis as an interpretation or as an elaborate description of an interpretation that Hitchcock himself is doing in his films. I don't know if that question made sense. I'm not sure I've got it. So, um, I, I guess what I'm saying is Hitchcock's films, like many complex films, always play at two levels. One is the level at the, which the plot is articulating, and then is how Hitchcock renders it through mise-en-scene. And it's always at that mise-en-scene level that we'll see some kind of lighting or some kind of prop effect, which always will be some phallic symbol, et cetera, et cetera. And that seems to be in a kind of interpretation by Hitchcock of the plot that he's presenting. So today, when you were presenting, I was wondering if you would describe the work that you were doing today as describing the work that Hitchcock is doing and presenting this to us, or interpreting it. And I don't know if that question is even interesting. So I, 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 was, I was trying to construct a possible interpretation and test its explanatory power over against other, another possible way of interpreting the film. And what I ended up suggesting was that um, because of the nature, I mean, I, there's an interesting methodological issue that comes up in relation to my closing suggestions <coughs> about the way Freudian language is being used by Hitchcock in order, cinematic Freudian language, in order to say things about things that cannot be said overtly because of the censors. That raises an issue of how um, exoteric and esoteric aspects of, uh, of uh, meaning are related to each other. <clears throat> and part of what I was so you know, the whole tradition of Strauss and um, persecution and the art of writing, what it is to interpret figures who, for some important contextual reason, have things they want to say that cannot be said more overtly. That is a, in this film in particular, with a British Catholic coming into a, an American Protestant setting, and if I'm right, wanting to say something that must not be said overtly about Americans and the war. Um, that's, I think, the most interesting methodological issue with respect to interpretation that arises here. It's also related to Kermode on uh, the interpretation of Mark. Um, now, part of what I'm saying is that um, uh, Richard says, Hitchcock uses Freud in order to develop his plots. That's not the same thing as saying that he's committed to a total Freudian worldview. 
that means um, and part of what I'm suggesting is one way of interpreting how he could be doing that and actually be committed to a kind of Augustinianism. Uh, in other words, it doesn't have to be an either or with respect to that point or with respect to the aestheticism. Uh, you can be a romantic ironist with respect to the main devices of style. You can be committed to using Freudianism in order to hammer out the basic lines of plot. Right? And you can have other things, other big issues that are uh, driving your work forward. Uh, that's what I'm suggesting. And uh, now one further point. That Straussian theme or the Kermodian theme has to do with how, uh, let's put it this way. Uh, someone creating films under circumstances like that, under censorship, uh, politically dangerous circumstances, um, they're going to create meaning structures that are something like Russian dolls, or I, I, I use the image of the, of the suitcase with the false bottom. In Hitchcock, the, the reason I say Russian dolls or Chinese boxes is that with Hitchcock, you can't be sure that you've reached the last innermost uh, box. You've, you, you've, you get to a certain level of the suitcase. You've got a false bottom. You've had a wow experience. You get to, and you're saying, see, something else is going on here. Well, is the, is the bottom false bottom um, the outlook of an aesthete, or is it something else again? That's the difficulty. Of, that's the real difficulty in interpreting Hitchcock. And it might be, this is why I was so tentative in putting forward my hypothesis, um, it might be that if you go one layer deeper than I've managed, he's also ironizing the Augustinianism. Right. That's the key issue, isn't it? It's where the irony where the irony stops. <laughs> I wanted to ask uh, I, I wanted to ask you a question that you sort of brushed over at the beginning. I'll come back to you, but the question you brushed over at the beginning, which is I don't know how it would do over time, but brushed over at the beginning, which is the, the the question of the and I'm not an expert on these issues. Uh, you are, uh, so that's what I'm asking. I mean, there's the relation. The the, the French critics, um, you know, claimed. Hitchcock for, for Jansenism. Um, uh, um, I think Bazin actually asked Hitchcock whether he's a Jansenist or not because he was actually trying to refute the uh, idea right. that, they, that the French critics were uh, onto something important and was uh, quite pleased when Hitchcock told them that he had no idea what it meant. But, but they... Chabrol and so on. Yes, Chabrol and Romer. Uh, Chabrol and Romer wrote this very important book called Hitchcock's The First 44 Films and, uh, where Romer proposed... Uh, uh, which is the first serious work of criticism on Hitchcock and probably still one of the most important. Um, and Romer's films certainly take up uh, 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 um, uh, uh, Pascalian, uh, Jansenist theme, a uh, uh, film like uh, My Night at Maud's, for example. Um, and so, so uh, you know, I wondered, you know, and you, you actually uh, made the point that the, the, the both the Je, Je, a Jesuitical and a Jansenist branch are both Augustinian, and you you wanted to rep so I just wanted you to to, to 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 hear actually what you thought about the the notion that Hitchcock is in some way uh, was it is a Jansenist in, in relationship to I suppose was that my understanding of that is is I suppose uh, um, you know it's the idea that uh, that. Uh, um, uh, the only uh, 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 the only way to be you can't you're, you're not going to uh, 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 s s uh, and you raised it in the in the uh, pointing to shadow of a doubt you know it's not good good deeds uh, uh, that are going to uh, uh, save you um, it's only divine grace um, and in a way that was alluded to as you pointed out at the beginning of shadow of a doubt in the speech made by young Charlie uh, but so I just wondered whether that French view like the French Hitchcock. Um, what, what you think of that and, and, and where that fits in. So I guess the first thing I was saying about that was that um, in that early critical work, 
the french were not being very clear about what the possible varieties of augustinianism no were and they were riveted on breast all as a paradigm case yes and because he almost at least in some of his remarks but also in the way he wrote his little book called attention to the pascal connection that's what they were thinking about so the then the that's what led to as an as question how are you you know can you out hitchcock how do you feel about being interpreted in this way and he's saying i think quite honestly i don't even know what a jansenist is he's not part of that parisian world where jansenism is the and pascal are the main figures so i i imagine um i'm imagining though that his interest in the critique of diversion led him at some point to read pascal on divertissement that's as far as it goes i think um so all augustinians hold that uh grace comes grace is essential and is a divine gift so it's not something that uh human beings by works can deserve right the important division within this tradition especially in the period we're talking about is a division over whether sanctification as something in which the justified sinner participates actively is uh is part of what's uh central to the christian life it's very it's pretty clear that bresson has no interest in sanctification so whether whether the sinner the the sinner has to do anything you mean essentially in order, yeah, to so achieve, uh, in order to in order to achieve grace is there something we have to do so there's a a very strong strand of protestantism but also jansenist catholicism which is very suspicious of the idea that the sinner the justified sinner justified that is now in a relationship that has been put right by an act of divine grace received by the sinner uh the jansenists and the and many protestants are suspicious of the idea that anything more than that should be talked about by way of sort of active participation and cultivation of virtue and progress toward fuller virtuous identification with uh uh this new vocation um now, if you go over to someone like Tarkovsky in a film like Andrei Rubilov, that's all about sanctification, though in Russian Orthodox terms, it's called deification. That's about, uh, so it's all about the, the very significant spiritual movement that occurs for the central character um, after, uh, in, in which he participates that's that's a model of transformation all based on that one passage that i referred to earlier be not conformed to the world be transformed that process of transformation as something in which the justified sinner can participate that leads to another whole variety of filmmaking that is quite distinct from bresson's it's hard to tell in Hitchcock's case because his films like most of Bresson's later ones are all about the condition of sin not about the transformation of someone as a result of grace so that whole area of ethical life doesn't come into view well Robin Wood makes that point that Hitchcock offers no solutions uh, and there's no there's a... well the solutions are present so in in vertigo when the when scotty turns away from the sanctuary <laughs> he's turning away from what hitchcock regards if, if hitchcock is an augustinian uh, roman catholic 
he regards that sanctuary as the real presence of christ that's there it's significant that he's turning away from it and that you know the movement up the tower occurs as a result of a turning away from it well i so it's not that the the possible solutions are not represented at all in hitchcock films it's just that the characters are not partaking right the characters are being shown turning away from that and then what we're getting is a study of sin of conformity to the world not transformation so that leaves open the possibility that he's quite at odds with lutherans and jansenists over over what that transformation looks like right. and the extent to which uh human beings can participate in it as on the back Last question. Last question. Last question. Hi. Um, I have sort of a leading question, I guess. Um, you were talking about the layers of sort of inscrutable irony in Hitchcock. And I'm wondering if it seems to me that Hitchcock tends to leave you, it, his film's interpretations tend to lean one way or the other in the sense that um, the way I would, I guess, illustrate it is comparing this to f a later work, Frenzy, um, in which it seems like the sort of evil of that um, sexual pervert character um, is more a product of cosmic indifference than like social or individualistic moral problems. So there's the famous shot where you, you know the, the characteristics of the the pervert and he takes a woman up to a room and the camera backs down and onto the street and everybody's <coughs> walking by but it sort of sort of seems to go further up to more God's eye view and it starts with a sort of God's eye view but it seems like almost a deist or agnostic perspective in that one and this one um, by your interpretation it would seem more likely it seems like it's problematic but he is leaning more towards an augustinian catholic um sort of sense of of, of sin and and existence of a higher power to which these characters are accountable i'll have to think about what you're saying about frenzy um it makes me in, immediately think of um the camera position at the beginning of psycho so, which could be interpreted as a God's eye view. Which well, the bird's eye view. A bird's eye view, <laughs> right. <laughs> the birds is another one of the deep ones. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I was going to cite the birds. Yeah. Yeah. Which, is, which is, you know, uh, in which the theme of apocalypse, yeah. uh, and, and you've got the, re the overt reference to Jeremiah, you've got all of that's going on. Um, yeah, so I... Uh, I guess I, I guess what I want to say in this case, as well as in some of the disputes over Bresson, um, my own view is that um, just judging from the content of the relevant films, I don't think you can infer that the filmmaker, if he's Augustinian most of the time, has changed his mind. I don't think that's true with Bresson, though it's sometimes said that because there's no representation of grace later on, that means that Bresson has changed his mind about this. It's just that he gets increasingly dark. That's perfectly consistent with, a, with, a, uh, with an Augustinian view if you're taking the relevant film to be a study of another variety of sinfulness. And that might well be the case in Frenzy. I, uh, I, uh, I have to study the film more carefully to figure that out. So, we thank uh, Jeffrey Stout and Richard Allen for the wonderful <laughs>